Hello and welcome to SU4J. Getting better at it. <laughs> now before I start, I promised my friend that I would give her Etsy shop a little plug because she makes really beautiful jewellery. So there you go. Aren't they lovely? Right, now I'm going to talk to you today about those really embarrassing encounters on field service. And I think everyone's got one of these stories. And I know they're at the extreme end of our experiences as Jehovah's Witnesses, but they are comedy gold, so we can't afford to miss them out of a bit of lampooning. So what triggered this was a discussion that somebody started on Recovery Group 3 called Salil Daniels. And I asked her if I could use her example because it was so brilliant. So she says that when she was a teenager or a kid, her mum used to get all these Bible studies that nobody else wanted with the really skanky people. And that she, her mum had a Bible study with a woman who she says was a severe chain smoker, a hoarder and a cat lady. And she said she spat when she spoke and she kind of yelled because she must have been deaf. But the worst part of it was, she said, there were about 150 cats in the house. You can just imagine the scene, can't you? This is not just your normal cat lady, the kind of cat lady that I aspire to be. This was a cat lady in extremis. And Salil says that something always happened every time they went for a Bible study. So one time throughout the duration of the Bible study, she watched a cat die in front of them. And then another time, she says, one of the cats was having kittens and another one of them was eating the kittens during the Bible study. I can't think of anything more horrifying than this situation in this skanky, skanky house. And she said that eventually... The woman was evicted and the cats all had to be rescued by the RSPCA and that the house itself was so filthy it had to be destroyed. The house had to be destroyed because it was so... Imagine taking your child along to that Bible study and sitting there and pretending that everything was normal with your Bible. Oh, let's read a scripture about paradise <laughs> and there's cats shitting and eating each other and dying in front of you my god and it made me think I think there's reasons why as witnesses we felt obliged that we had to embrace all these crazy people um, and these are some of the reasons so Jesus started it off it was his fault he um, had the, the the thing with the sinful woman didn't he who they said oh she was probably a prostitute and she came and she wept on his feet and then she wiped him with her hair and then she anointed him with oil and all the pharisees were looking and going oh she's a sinful woman and jesus was a gate oh yeah well let him who's cast the first you know him who's the purest cast the first stone and everybody sort of backed down and so you know there was the thing oh you've got to embrace sinful people yeah, that's fair enough, but I bet she, you know, this woman was a prostitute, not a crack whore. Well, she, she wasn't, you know, like, oh, anyway. One of the other reasons why we felt really obliged to embrace all these people was that um, Acts 4.13 described the apostles as um, unlettered and ordinary. Yeah, ordinary, ordinary, not filthy, deranged, stinky grot bag alcoholics who lived in squalor they were ordinary but they, these ideas have kind of drip fed to make us feel obliged to embrace every dirty disgusting mental person that we've come across another one that i think a scripture that is slightly misapplied is first corinthians 1 26 where it says god chose the foolish things of the world that he might put uh, wise men to shame and so they've gone like in the extreme haven't they like oh let's find the most foolish foolish of foolish mentally deranged Dero who lives in the bus station <laughs> and sings Elvis songs and rambles to himself yeah God didn't choose those he didn't choose the complete loons did he but unfortunately, that's what the scripture says. It says God chose the foolish things and so, oh God. So then we've got to be like linked to these fools in some evil three-legged race. And then the other one that I think is really misapplied is Matthew 6, 19, where it says, 
If your eye is simple, your whole body will be bright. And it's talking about having a simple life, I think. I mean, I don't know, who cares? But this thing of simple, simple. Yeah, if your eye is simple, if you don't want loads of stuff, not if your brain is simple. <laughs> We're not talking about flowers for Algernon here. We're not talking about actual people with learning disabilities god chose those and the stinky deros and the alcoholics and the crack cause to put the, the wise men to shame but for some reason we've all felt obliged to embrace these but none of us dare go do you know what actually that person is proper rank and disgusting and i'm not gonna sit in the house catching communicable diseases from and taking my children there i'm not gonna take my children and force them to sit for an hour and listening to these people pretending it's normal now i had one of these examples of an embarrassing bible study story and it went like this it started when i was quite young I'll probably get the details wrong, but God, it's ancient history, so you'll have to forgive me. So there was a guy called Fred, and he was a bit simple, and he, he lodged with an old lady called Alice, and I think Alice kind of looked out for him. But later on, as I as, as time went on, Fred, either Alice died or Fred moved out or something, Fred got himself a young wife and bread. He had belly fruit with her. And then he got himself another young wife. <laughs> And they had belly fruit with her. And they all lived together like a big happy family. And we didn't really criticise too much because the bottom line was we got three Bible studies out of it. <laughs> and even better, the two young wives who were having belly fruit to Fred couldn't read. They were illiterate. So when I was then a teenager, I remember going along with a girl that was only a few years older than me. And we studied with, with young wife number two. And I remember young wife number two uh, showing, showing me and my friend some photographs that Fred had taken of her. And they were essentially semi-pornographic. They you know, sort of her half-dressed crawling on the floor with no pants on and things. And, and she didn't realise that this was supposed to be a private, embarrassing thing because she was a bit learning deficient, whatever, you, whatever PC term you'd like to call it. She was a bit retarded. So she just thought, and we were like, oh my God. And I would be in 15, I was just mortally embarrassed. But, you know, we got a Bible study out of it. So we weren't going to criticise too much. And I remember going through that, that brochure we had, the one with just all the pictures and <laughs> big circles with lines through to show it. This is naughty. No, no bad. And it was like, the, the can't, you can't, I can study the Bible, but I can't read brochure or whatever it was called. Unfortunately, there wasn't a photograph, there wasn't a picture in that brochure of like semi-pornographic um, poly, polygamous marriages. No, naughty. So and we were too, me and my friend were a bit too young to have the, the kahunas to point out that you shouldn't really have, you shouldn't really be living more than one wife and lots of kids in one family. Really, it's not normal. Um. Also on that um, discussion thread on um, Recovery Group 3, somebody else put their example of a terrifying uh, field service experience. She said that when she was 15, her parents had a return visit on a trailer home. So I'm guessing this is America because we, we don't, we have caravans in England, we don't call them trailer homes. She says it was the dirtiest, stinkiest place she'd ever seen. And she said that they had two toddlers who were young boys who were naked and filthy and crawling over her as her mum and dad were studying with the parents and she said uh, as a 15 year old she said to quote it was super awkward having dirty naked kids crawling all over you <laughs> and yet it's just like you know i don't know put that mm, that shield of mm, this isn't happening these people are studying the bible this could almost be normal but when you step back and think about it holy crap a moly you wouldn't take your kids to these dirty disease infested places what if they came back with ringworm or something oh fleas or mites or oh it's making me itch just thinking about it and then somebody else said that they went to a class A hoarder's house and the person hoarded things and animals. <laughs> and this person said the stench of dog shit was so overpowering that they almost fainted. 
And yeah, I remember these houses. I remember being invited in by them, by blatant drug users with... Um, I've seen drug paraphernalia. I'm sure you have. Somebody else mentioned needles in letterboxes on this discussion thread. I remember going into these houses. Would you ever send your teenager to a, a drug den <laughs> armed with nothing but a Bible? <laughs> and the worst thing was, when I went to this drug place with my pioneer partner, who was an ex-druggie himself, so he felt he was all down and hippity-hoppity happening and he knew what it was all about. But they always made you a drink. They were always really hospitable, weren't they? Why were they so hospitable? Why didn't they just shut the door on us like all the normal people did? But they always made you a drink in a cracked cup. Oh, God. And I remember my 15-year-old self thinking, Oh, what diseases are in those cracks? Oh, God, the agony of trying to, trying to think of the right scriptures when the other half of your brain was... I was looking at the cracks and working out what diseases were in them. Oh, it's just inhumane when you think about it now. I wouldn't let my my son even play with a, a filthy, naked child, let alone go around and, and go into the house and share the Bible with them. And they didn't really want a Bible study, did they? They were just lonely. They just wanted someone to talk to. They wanted a bit of company. They were so smacked off their tits that they were willing to agree with anything you said, just so that you'd stay for a while and drink some disease from one of their cracked cups and watch their cats dying or something. <laughs> I know all field service isn't like that, but it does make me think that the more time goes on and the more the more the the sane people leave who are able to research on the internet, the more the Jehovah's Witness religion must be sort of concentrating down into a small concentrated lump of of deluded, deranged and, and ill people, illiterate, stinky, horrible, uncritical people who just end up witnessing to, to drug users and crack whores. <laughs> thank God, thank God I've left. Thank you for listening to another episode of SU4J.